Hey guys, today's video is going to be about China. I, this has been a video I've wanted to make for a while, talking about all of the things that are happening there that I find to be very, very negative, and why I believe this country could be headed towards a depression in the next several years. Now, to preface this, I don't know if that's gonna if it's really going to impact them and the global economy for a year, maybe even more. This is not a short term play where you want to where you want to get puts against their market this is just the reality of what's building they do have central banking control and i should say central it's not even central banking it's central government control that has allowed this ponzi scheme to go on for a very very long time but we're going to walk through this and talk about why the downfall of china is coming and why it's going to be one of the worst downfalls we've seen in our lifetimes of a major economy since the Great Depression. All right, on that fun note, let's get started. So first, you probably heard this one, they have a massive demographic cliff. When you compare this to India, the problem, the thing you want to see here is you want to see a pyramid in this demographic chart because it means you're up and coming, right? Well, up and coming ended years ago for China. You can see where the, the peak here in the, in the dem demographics is in the 35 to 39 range. And they've got a large population in the almost 60 range as well. That's incredibly problematic when you've had a one-child policy that existed for over a decade. It's over now, but if you look at the birth rate, it's getting worse, not better, because people are finding hopelessness in China, and so they're not having children and again, you could just see how much better India's position. Now, they will have problems probably in the future. This will catch up with them, but hopefully they're not dumb enough to do a one-child policy. But look at this peak demographic, 15 to 19. India is set to dominate in the decades ahead. Um, all right, that's one point I wanted to make. Next. Oh, let me see here. Oh, I wanted to go back, actually. The decline of China's population, this ties in with what we were just looking at. If you look here, there's future projections, which we need to ignore. Projections going out to 2100 are not going to be reliable, so let's just ignore that. Now, what I want to show you is what's already happened, though. Now, China's one-child policy, one policy ended over here in about the, I don't know if it was 2017 or what it was, right around that range. But what you can see is the massive decline I was just talking about. It hasn't gotten better. And this was around the pandemic, so there's definitely something to be said around that time. There were deaths that, that occurred um, all around the world. You can see a decline, too, in the United States. Um, I don't know how many people were having babies around the time, but there was definitely a dip. What's important to note, here's what's important to note. Look at the rebound in India and China after that time frame. They're bouncing right back. And this isn't just in the projection zone. This is in reality, okay? We're not in, fully into projection yet. And yet we're seeing that China this last year went into decline. And that's by official data. I actually think they started doing that maybe a year or two ago. So not a good setup. Not a good setup when you've got a massive demographic cliff. And then also you've got a declining population that's steepening. And I think that this projection is nowhere close to what it'll be. All right, this is just a factoid. Um, it's really hard to find immigration data with China. There is none. It's just basically what's happening in the United States, right? So they don't they don't let you know that they're seeing outflows. They they don't advertise that stuff. They've actually China has removed over ninety three percent of their their economic data over the last, since the pandemic or right around. So it's really hard to know what's true in China anymore. You have to realize that. This is just a factoid from Congressman Kevin Hearn. It says, and this is back in March of 2023, so this is outdated by almost a year now, but it's some of the most relevant information I can find um, because we're not doing a lot to update our uh, immigration data either because I don't know how much we actually want to advertise that's going on at the border. So again, this is a tough subject, but I, I just want to point this out because it is very important. It's only gotten worse. It says, in the last month, again, 10 months ago, Immigration officers encountered 1,064 Chinese immigrants at the southern border, a 1,200% increase compared to January of the previous year. So this goes to show that after the lockdown started to, to um, end this last year and their economy in China was supposed to open up and become so strong and so vast, uh, people were using it as a time to flee. Part of the reason is those lockdowns 
were three years long. Now, to be clear, lockdowns didn't really happen in manufacturing. They basically forced those laborers, if they wanted to keep their jobs, which they did, to live in the factories and work all the time. That's why you were getting a bunch of cheap goods during COVID. So those people didn't get locked down. Well, they got locked down at work. Imagine how much fun that is. Imagine what that does to somebody's mental health when they spend 70, 80 hours a week working and then stay at the place they work at and don't get to see their families. Anyway, I digress. That wasn't the most damning thing that happened during three plus years of lockdowns. We had it so easy here in the States and other democratic parts around the world. Even though they were authoritarian in nature, they were a fraction of what happened. Because at least in the United States, we have a state system where some states said, you know what, F you government, we're not doing that. We're going to stay open. And some didn't. And we got to see data points coming out of these and figure out which ones were better and which ones were worse. And that's very important. Now, they didn't get that luxury. They just stayed locked down. So small businesses were destroyed. They were destroyed. Delivery services, great. Online services from big powerhouses, great. But hundreds of thousands to uh, businesses were just wiped out all over the country because they couldn't they couldn't commence with basic services. They couldn't have people in their restaurants. They didn't have people coming to their stores. So China has gutted their small business sector, which for most economies is one of the most important. It's just gone in China. And you need to be very clear of that fact. It's very, very important. Why is it important? Why are these things important? So again, China was doing good on manufacturing, right? That was, that was something that was doing all right. Here's the problem. China's relationship with the United States and its Western partners is very, 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 very important. Why is it important? 70% of their exports come to the West or Western-aligned countries. Now, this is a very big deal. Look at all these exports. We're the number one, for, and this, this is a little bit outdated. This is a few months old, uh, maybe uh, almost a year, so about 10 months old when I posted this. But look at this. United States, almost, I, I marked Hong Kong in green as Western because that is basically a staging zone for more Western shipments. So I put that in there too. So look at this, Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, Germany, Netherlands, India. India has become more aligned with the West in the last year. So I should actually flip that over. Um, if anything, again, they're more aligned. United Kingdom, Malaysia, Thailand, Mexico, Australia, Canada, France, United Arab Emirates, Italy, Poland, Spain. All these places are more aligned to the West than they are Asia. Okay? So, and then there's a smaller group down here. So the vast majority of exports are coming to nations like, like ours or friendly aligned nations. And there's a big problem with with China because they're seeing a massive drop and deflation in prices of exports over the last couple of years. Massive decline. Uh, worst on record. And stuff that they haven't seen in the last like 25 years of major economic investment in the country. So we know they're heavily dependent upon us buying their goods. And we can see that they're having to drop export prices substantially. This is problematic. It's, it's more problematic when we look at their manufacturing sector and see it in stark decline. A decline like we haven't seen, if you look at this area under the red here, since the pandemic and going back to 2008. So they're in a structural decline that is insane. We haven't even covered a, a decent amount of these talking points yet. All we've covered are like, population they have negative immigration they have they have no immigration because they've they've basically pushed away capitalism and westerners and all kinds of people all their neighbors they've attacked verbally and physically through different altercations and through wolf warrior diplomacy which is basically them just yelling at their neighbors and telling them you'll do it our way or you'll die and then you have this so you have negative immigration now you have a demographic cliff that's horrible and much worse than anything in the United States or India. And then you have a manufacturing sector that is in decline that they're heavily dependent upon. And we're seeing prices plummet. Let's move on. Foreign direct investment. 
China is in like this bluest tint here, this light blue. It is in steep decline. India rebounding, going much higher. Mexico, our biggest trade partner now, not China anymore. So we're ending our manufacturing agreements and our purchasing and stuff from these guys. And we're, we're changing it to different countries like, like India, Mexico, Vietnam, and uh, Indonesia, and other parts of the Asiatic region and Central America. These are becoming our friends and more and more and more. And China is losing and it's, everybody's just running away. It's really bad in every possible way. China, so many people don't know this. China's debt to GDP is 279% while the USA is 120% and falling, falling. This full article, um, I probably could have pulled up the archive of this, talks about that and their shadow banking sector and how the numbers could be worse, substantially worse than this because they have local government debts that are a black box because they're local government entities that aren't easily reportable. The Western world does not have a view into these. Their shadow banking sector is huge. And then there's the real estate market. Oh, the real estate market. You've heard all the common stuff about Evergrande and all the other businesses that are falling up. Country Garden and uh, I think Zhao or something. I can't. There's so much decline. It's un unreal. We're not focusing on that. We're just looking at some charts here. So what I wanted to point out in here is that China is seeing massive downfall in their real estate sector. That started in 2021, roughly. They were still building a lot, but they weren't selling them anymore. And so we've got the steep decline. Now, it looks good here because their manufacturing sector and their infrastructure has still been going up, right? But what you don't see here is that it's starting to roll over on the infrastructure because there's just no need for infrastructure anymore. These guys have high-speed trains to nowhere that cost them billions of dollars a year to make to, to for the government to fund and for these local governments to fund and they don't need them you have all this building 30 to 40 percent of local government revenue was coming from real estate sales and those dried up three years ago so for three years these local government entities have been just dying just dying and they're being told by the chinese government the central government to build more infrastructure and to, to produce, because we need to meet our GDP goals. So you better produce, but you better lower spending. And these, these two goals don't work together. So you have a massive real estate decline. You have a manufacturing sector where their government is propping it up. Now, we're, there's it's, it's great short term, kind of, for them. I mean, they're getting their EVs out to the world, right? But they're a loss for each one. Even BYD isn't making these guys money. You've got to remember, this system is very opaque, and BYD even has very small margins by their math. And I don't think the overseas numbers look any better. And then they're like the leader in the industry. If you look at companies like Neo, they're just burning money, and they're going to be under. They've already lost ninety over 90% of the EV market uh, uh, makers in China are gone. They're just gone. And even though the government is heavily subsidizing this sector to try and crush foreign competition and EV creation. They're gone. And sure, short term, this might allow them to be able to build up more EVs. But there's only so far the government can go. And they're also doing this with commodities, um, all kinds of commodities. They're doing this with solar panels. Solar plant panel glut is everywhere right now. But the problem is, like I was showing you in that export chart, let me find that. They're not able to make money off of these. They're having to sell this stuff for nothing. And so this is a short-term like way of propping up these numbers. But fundamentally, it does nothing to help their economy. It's just more debt. It's very important to realize that. So if anything, the world and the Western nations that are buying up these solar panels are benefiting because they're getting stuff on the cheap on the cheap, but at the same time, they're starting to tariff these things so that they get more tax revenue and China won't see as much for sales in the future. So China is going to be ultimately damned and have a large surplus of a lot of stuff to try and grow these numbers and keep people employed. 
but they're not going to be able to do this forever because eventually the market can only absorb so much. So you have a real estate sector that's been failing for four years, but they haven't felt that yet. Why? Why haven't they felt that? Because they might have had sales dropping for four years, but what hasn't happened is they didn't stop building. You might have heard all this news about China and Evergrande and Country Garden and all these others failing, being liquidated, their bonds being, you know, just destroyed. But they let most of the foreigners absorb these problems and then tried to prop up local entities that were invested in it. But that stuff's collapsing. And here's the problem. The construction section was still building. They were still building. They haven't seen the rollover yet. You can see it here under construction. It's starting to slope, but it hasn't seen this steep decline. It hasn't seen this steep decline. It lags by three to four years. So only now are we going to start to see the pain, the ultimate pain of the real estate sector collapsing. It's barely started. Deflation is everywhere in China. Going back for the last year plus, 13 months, China has seen nothing but producer prices in decline. Massive decline. This is the sign of a recession. And if it continues, it will be a depression. I don't know how well you can see this graph. Let me see if I can. No, I just can't get it that good. I do apologize. You can kind of see it, but it's bad. It's all, all in the red. Here, this one's a little bit better. So this is the China inflation rate. And look at this. They have no inflation anymore. It's all deflation. They can't rate lower rates that aggressively because they're not the world reserve currency. And they already have so many economic issues and debt. They're in trouble. Now, everybody's been talking for a while about all of the stimulus that they're going to provide. And they have tried to stimulate. They've tried to. You can see here, stealth intervention fails to halt China's market decline. CSI 300 versus the world. So there's been little things that have been done to intervene. But you have to listen to Xi. I don't know how many of you actually listen to Xi. He's very clear. He hates capitalism. He's got a book called Xi Jinping's Thoughts, like a great Maoist dictator, the person who has massacred more Chinese people or human beings on earth than anyone in history. In the entire history of the earth, Mao was the worst. He was the start of the CCP, right? And he had, he had books about him and he was a god as well. Xi wants to be a god. It's very important to realize that. And he believes that the way forward is through war and showing China's economic power. And he believes that capitalism is evil. And he's been working for years to destroy the capitalistic bubble. And he's achieving that. But you have to realize this is the goal. This is what he says. Go buy his book. Listen to the God in action and what he believes and what he is trying to accomplish. Take the man for his words, because everybody keeps talking about how stimulus is coming. Oh, stimulus is coming to China, and yet we don't see it. We see people fleeing the country. We see things like this. China investors snap up ETFs tracking foreign gauges. They're trying to get the hell out or at least limit their risk. They're trying to buy whatever investments they can locally so that they aren't destroyed. I can show you videos of these people in the saddest of states as they go from being multimillionaires and some of the wealthiest people on earth to living on the streets. These aren't people that didn't try. They tried really hard. They worked hard. Chinese people work hard but they have nothing to show for it. And he's destroying them. And they're fleeing this country the best they can 
trying to preserve their wealth, trying to save their lives and their families. And the idiots in the West are listening to people like Bloomberg and BlackRock telling them to buy the dip. It pisses me off. If these people could get out, they would. Anyway, I digress. So, this right here, the Kobayashi letter, a eh, little bit pessimistic, but has some good stuff now and again. Breaking, nearly 30% of all stocks in China have been halted. This was last week. The CSI 1000, think of this as the Russell. They've got like a 3000, I think, too. Slides 8% in a matter of hours. The Chinese stock, 8%. Look at these indices in China. Meanwhile, CSI 100 and Hong Kong 50 indices, which represent Chinese large caps, are up on the day. And what they didn't say, I think it says it in here. Yeah, CSI index extends your losses 30%. And I don't know if it's in this post or not, but they had, oh yeah, yeah, sorry, I just read it. 30% of all stocks in China have been halted at this time. And this was on February 4th. Now, this all got better because there's talks about G meeting with economic advisors and yada, 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 and how they're going to look to stimulate. They've been saying that for over a year. Two years. Three years. If you look back, everything was supposed to be stimulated. The bond market was supposed to be saved for Evergrande and Country Garden. They're dying. These businesses were supposed to be saved. They were supposed to turn around. Everything they say they're doing is that they're going to start leaning towards capitalism and that they want investment dollars. But every action they take is the exact opposite. And yet fools still put their money here. Blows my mind. They're even tightening. This is the sign of a collapsing civilization when Futu and Up Fintech, two of the largest online cross-border brokerages, will remove their trading apps in China. So they're basically trying to prevent outflows. They're trying to prevent outflows. There's talk, and I don't know if it's true. I can't really find anything to know if it's true of Hong Kong approving Bitcoin ETFs. But I worry that even if they do, it's just a trap. It's just a trap to consume money in China. But they're, they're trying to prevent outflows. When this is happening, this is bad. This is bad. And then it, here, Hong Kong government set up a task force to enhance stock market liquidity and strengthen the capital market. August 2023, what's happened? Where's the liquidity? What has the task force done? How much are they going to help their markets? Is it savable? We know when we go back and look at this demographic cliff and their population decline, and we know that capital outflows are large. I thought I put that in there, but there's one in here in capital outflows that shows historic numbers too. It's crazy. We can see their export price is dropping. We know their manufacturing is dropping because everybody's fleeing. We know that foreign direct investment is increasing in all of their competitors, and yet it's still plummeting in their country. We know their debt to GDP, not including the depths of the shadow bank, is horrific. People complain about the United States all the time and how we're indebted. China is infinitely worse now. In 2008, they were great. They had a bunch of U.S. dollars. They could just spend and build. They never stopped spending and building. Communism, top-down, forget communism, top-down management. How many of you have liked that in your life? How many of you have been like, I love this place I work at. The CEO tells me everything I have to do, never listens to my input, and then just does whatever they want to do. On a whim, they change their minds sometimes. This is the best thing ever. I'm so happy. How many of you have thought that in your lives? Do you think top-down management works? That's exactly what communism is. And what happens when you have top-down management? What happens when you have the top, the CCP, the 10 to 15% getting all the wealth and power? People complain about corruption in the United States. China is a magnified version of that, an order of magnitude worse. 
and yet you put your money in it. Just baffling. Anyway, let me hop over here to China and see if there's anything else I want to talk about. Oh, they have the largest banks in the world. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? So, I don't know when China blows up. It could be a year. It could be three years. They have a direct government controlling everything. So it's really just a glorified Ponzi scheme at this point. And, and so in 2008, we had about five years of Ponzi scheme with real estate, right? We had adjustable rate mortgages that were setting people up for failure. We had, we had rating agencies like Moody's giving ratings to this conglomerated debt that was garbage and giving it AAA status. So we had the, and then we had people highly leveraged in derivative trades. And derivatives, just think of it as insurance, except nobody knows what the fuck is going on. Nobody knows who holds all the liabilities because it's so unregulated. It's a little bit better now. Not better in China. Biggest banks in the world. You know what we don't have here? What we don't know, and what I'm sure is horrific, their liabilities, their derivatives, who holds the insurance. We have no idea. Someday, if there is a depression that's global, it will be from China. China will cause it. China probably will be in a depression. Um, it's just a matter of time. You can't have... So when America had the Great Recession that almost destroyed our banking system, even though we were the world reserve currency, we were able to bail it out, right? But China's been doing this for 20 years at least 10 that have been horrific indebtedness, corruption, shadow banking, leveraging, derivatives, heavily focus on this stuff. This will be a disaster. It probably will spill over to the rest of the world. Don't know when, can't tell you that. It's too hard to know. You can't look into you can't look through black glass and have clarity on when it's going to happen. You just can't. Let me see what else we got. This video right here is one of my favorites. I'm going to repost this right now. Um, it's a very thoughtful analysis about what's happening in China and its Ponzi and its collapse. Let me see here if there's anything else. Yeah, there's just so much. You see foreigners selling stock in the new year. So again, outflows. Foreigners trying to get out. You'll see some articles where it sounds like foreign or there's inflows. It's bullshit. Ignore it. Let me see if there's anything else good that I've, I've skipped. I think that's probably it. Anyway, I can tell you, I follow this conversation intimately. Intimately. Um, for over five or six years, I don't think there's any of you that know this better than I do. And I say that with great confidence. So invest in China if you want to. I will not put a dime towards it. I don't even recommend people short it because, again, there's just no way to know. There's no way to know if you get paid. You don't even own. I didn't include this in here. You don't even own things when you buy stocks in China. Did you know that? Did you know that almost all of them are incorporated in the Cayman Islands and you don't actually own the underlying asset? Did you know that you can't own real estate in China? Chinese people can't own real estate in China. They get 75-year leases. There is no ownership. You own paper. There is nothing legally binding to anything that you buy with a stock. Nothing. I'm done. Why do my rants always take about 30 minutes? That's the real question. Anyway, I love you guys. I just want you to know the truth. Please, stay the fuck away from China for your own sake. And then pray for the Chinese people. They need it. Love you. What a way to start a Monday. Talk to you later.